Hi everyone, this is Haney, and welcome to part two of our cardiac and lung ultrasound in the ED lecture series. In this lecture, we're going to cover more advanced topics, including the E-point septal separation, or the EPSS. Next, we'll talk about the right heart and why the right heart matters. And then last, we'll talk about ultrasound use in cardiac arrest. So first, we're going to talk about the EPSS. What is the EPSS? This stands for the E-point septal separation. And how to actually obtain this is you first want to start by obtaining a parasternal long view. You're going to then use the M-mode tool and drop that line through the anterior tip of the mitral valve, and it'll spit out an image that looks like this. So just to recap, M-mode plots what's going on in this line over a series of time. So the very first thing that you're going to hit here is the right ventricular wall, followed by the RV cavity, followed by the septum here. Following that, this is all the LV cavity, and then this is the LV free wall back here. And what's happening is the mitral valve is opening, meaning that the heart is in diastole or is filling, and this generates the E wave. And the tip of the mitral valve will actually come very near the septum. And then you'll also get that atrial kick, which is the A wave that you see here. So when you're evaluating for function, you can actually measure the space in between the tip of the mitral valve and the septum. And that is what we refer to as the E point septal separation. It correlates pretty well with the left ventricular ejection fraction. There's actually a formula here that you can use, but the takeaway is that you start to see a reduced function right around this 10 millimeter range, and that's the number that I want you guys to remember. So this is an example of a heart with a reduced ejection fraction. So just to recap some of our anatomy, here's our right ventricle, this is our left ventricle, this is our left atrium here, this is our aortic outflow, and this is our descending aorta. So again, pay attention to that anterior tip of the mitral valve, and what happens is when we actually drop the M-mode line through the tip of the valve, we'll plot and we'll see that the space between the E-wave and the top of the septum here is actually 2.6 centimeters. So this is meant to correlate with a very reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Here's another example. So again, pay attention to the LV walls. As the heart contracts, the LV walls should be getting thicker and the actual cavity of the LV should reduce in size. So the E-point septal separation is actually meant to be a more quantitative measurement, but you should use your visual clues as well when assessing for LV function. So in this example, we'll again drop the M-mode through the tip of the mitral valve here, and you'll see that the space between the tip of the mitral valve and the septum is about 2.05 centimeters, so also again correlating with the reduced ejection fraction. There's a couple of numbers to remember when talking about the EPSS. I generally use anything less than 7 millimeters and consider that to be normal, and anything greater than 10 millimeters to be reduced. So again, think about this conceptually. In a happy and healthy heart, the anterior tip of the mitral valve should high-five the septum every time the valve opens. But in somebody with a reduced ejection fraction, that valve is not going to come anywhere near the septal wall. So a higher number in this case is actually a reduced function. A couple of final points about the EPSS is first, use it in combination with the visual estimation. Again, pay attention to those LV walls and what the LV cavity size is doing, but it should certainly not be a replacement for what you see visually and what you think may be going on with the LV Second is, again, it's our job as ED providers to know whether the function is reduced, normal, or hyperdynamic, and not necessarily to tease out if the ejection fraction is 45 versus 35%. A couple of other points is with any sort of heart failure, often comes valvular disease, so things that may give you an artificially elevated EPSS are things like mitral stenosis or aortic regurgitation. Next is the plane of scanning. So when you're obtaining the parasternal long view, you really want that LV cavity size to be as long and as open as possible. So if you're out of plane, it may also give you an artificially elevated EPSS measurement. And then last is don't forget about diastolic heart failure. Again, we spend a lot of time talking about systolic heart failure, but there's an entire class of heart failure that exists, and that's diastolic heart failure. And that's a little bit more advanced and something that we're not going to cover today. And finally, don't forget to use your supplemental tools. So again, what you're seeing here is a lung ultrasound. Here's our pleural line, and you see these bright white comet tails go down to about 15 centimeters. Those are bee lines, and if you see them diffusely throughout the lung fields, that is indicative of pulmonary edema and something that may further help you decide what to do when dispositioning a patient in the ED. So that is the EPSS. Again, correlate with your visual estimation, and this should be an adjunct to your visual estimation and not necessarily to replace it. We'll change gears now, and we'll talk about the right heart and why the right heart matters. So let's again start by reviewing some of our anatomy. So this is a parasternal long view, and now 
we're going to pay attention to the right ventricle up at the top of the screen here. Next to that is our left ventricle. Here's our aortic valve and our aortic outflow tract. This is our left atrium. Here's our mitral valve, and this is our descending aorta. So a good general rule of thumb is that your left atrium, your aortic outflow tract, and your right ventricle should all be pretty similar in diameter, which you see nicely here. The other thing is to pay attention to the size and the shape of the RV itself. I was always classically taught that it should look triangular, kind of like this pizza slice, and that when it starts to look like a pie, then that's indicative of right heart dilation. The next thing is to pay attention to the size of the RV itself. So again, this is an apical four chamber view. Here's our left ventricle, our left atrium, our right ventricle, and our right atrium. And I know, again, that this is the, the right side of the heart for a couple of reasons. One is the tricuspid valve here sits closer to the apex, and that's always true. Next is I see this kind of fibrous band, which looks like it's sitting in the right ventricular apex. That is the moderator band, and again, only present in the RV and not in the LV. So those two things confirm to me that this is the right side of the heart, and this is the left side of the heart. The general ratio is it should be two-thirds LV to one-third RV. And that's important to know because you may get a little bit confused as the right heart st starts to dilate as to which side of the heart is which. Here's an example of a patient with right heart dilation. So again, this is a parasternal long view, but pay attention to our right ventricle up here. It no longer looks like that pizza triangular shape that we saw in the earlier example, but rather it looks significantly more large and more dilated. Next is pay attention to the size, right? So the normal ratio is two-thirds LV to one-third RV. But in this case, you're actually seeing that the RV looks significantly larger than the LV. So that would be indicative of right heart dilation. Here's another example. This one's a little bit more subtle. Again, this is a parasternal long view. And pay attention to the RV up here. What you're seeing is it loses that triangular shape, and this looks much more round and more indicative of maybe a mild to moderate right heart dilation. So the next question you want to ask yourself when seeing a dilated RV is, is there evidence of right heart strain? So there are four things that you want to look at when assessing for acute right heart strain. The first is, again, pay attention to the size. So once the RV starts to get larger than the LV in size, that's indicative of acute right heart strain. Next is pay attention to the septum here. So in a normal heart, the septum should not bow into the LV here because the LV is a much higher pressure, a much more robust system than the RV. But as the RV pressures begin to elevate and begin to dilate, you'll actually see the septum begin to bow into the LV, which is a marker of something bad is going on. Next, pay attention to this RV wall here. And as the RV begins to dilate and begins to fail, this RV wall, you'll notice, will actually become less mobile. So pay attention and have your eye at this point as well. And then the last thing is the McConnell sign, which is pretty rare. But that's when the actual apex of the RV becomes hypokinetic here. And it kind of gives you this appearance that the RV apex is bouncing up and down in kind of this paradoxical movement. That again is not very sensitive for acute PE. You can also see it in core pulmonale and as well as like a right heart MI. So just because it's there doesn't necessarily mean that it's a PE. Here's another example of right heart dilation. So again, pay attention to the RV size. It again looks like they're about equal here, not that two thirds to one third ratio. Again, pay attention to the RV shape. So this looks much more round and less pointed like we saw in some of the other examples. And then you actually see here some flattening of the septum and it looks like the septum may actually be bowing in to the LV here. Just remember that one view is no view. So in the same patient here, we rotate the probe about 90 degrees to get the peristernal short. And now what we're seeing is the RV size here and the LV here. And this is actually at the level of the mitral valve, but you're seeing pretty nicely here that the LV or the septum, the interventricular septum, is starting to bow into the LV. And that's what we call the D sign, because as you see, it starts to look like the letter D here, which is a marker of right heart strain. Here's another example. So this is an apical four chamber. And what you're seeing here is this is the right side of the heart here, and this is the left side of the heart here. You're seeing, again, the right heart appears significantly more dilated than the left heart which alone is a pretty good marker for right heart strain. But there's also another interesting finding here, and that's the McConnell sign. So you're seeing the dipping of the right ventricular apex here, which again, McConnell's is not really all that sensitive. You can get it in cases of an acute PE or something like a right heart MI or from core pulmonale from underlying COPD. So just because it's there doesn't mean that it's necessarily a PE.
So just keep your clinical context in mind. This is the spiral of death that's associated with right heart dilation and why we care about the right heart. But essentially what happens is that there's some process that starts to overwhelm the RV pressure and causes the patient to get volume overloaded. And that in turn causes this increased bowing of the interventricular septum into the LV and in turn decreasing the LV filling, decreasing the cardiac output and leading to hypotension. So then us in our mind is we say, well, let's give the patient fluids and let's see how they do. But that actually sends patients continuously down this spiral until they ultimately die. So that's why the right heart's so important and why it's important to know in an acutely unstable or hypotensive patient what the normal right heart looks like. So when the abnormal hits, you know what to do. So that is the right heart. Again, the right heart matters, so pay attention to it. We'll change gears now and we'll talk about the use of ultrasound in the setting of cardiac arrest and how ultrasound can help to really change and guide management. So we're all very well aware that what's going on on the rhythm strip does not necessarily correlate with what's going on on the heart itself. This was a good review of patients from 2010 to 2014. Essentially what they found is patients with this electrical activity, 14 of them actually had cardiac activity by ultrasound, whereas 32 of them had no cardiac activity by ultrasound. What's even more surprising is that patients with a rhythm of what was considered to be asystole, eight of them actually had cardiac activity by ultrasound, and 132 of them had no activity at all. My takeaway from this is that what's going on on the rhythm strip is not very sensitive and not very indicative of what's going on with the heart itself, and that ultrasound can really help you figure out what's going on. So if there is activity, what do we do? Well, here's an example, right? So this is a patient's apical four chamber view post arrest. And what you're seeing here is that the LV walls are not really contracting all that well. So this is indicative of a shock state and somebody that needs dobutamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine to really raise cardiac contractility. Or you may see in a case like this, right? This is a sub xiphoid view. So what you're seeing here is a left ventricle very, very slowly beat. There it goes there. So this is more of a rate issue and a patient that may need atropine, pacing, or epinephrine to help raise their heart rate. And then last is a case of this. So this is a rhythm strip reading asystole. When you're actually looking at the LV walls itself, you see that they're moving in a very fine fashion. This is actually fine V-fib, and this patient needs to be shocked. And just an FYI, 2.5% of asystole is actually fine VF. So just be aware of that and use ultrasound in each and every arrest to help you guide your management. So we're going to play a little game, activity or not. I'll show you a series of echoes, give you a little break, and then you decide if there's cardiac activity or not. Here's case number one. Do you see any evidence of cardiac activity? Yeah, me neither. Again, pay attention to the LV walls and try to look at what the LV walls are doing. And in this case, I'm not seeing them move whatsoever. So this is a case of no activity. Here's case number two. Do you see any evidence of activity? Yeah, this is pretty obvious, right? So again, look at the LV walls and look at the septum here. And what you're seeing is the LV walls themselves are contracting, not very well, but there is activity there. Here's the third case. Do you see any evidence of activity? So this one's a little tricky because one, the patient's actually getting a breath, which gives you the illusion that the LV walls are moving. And two, the mitral valve, which you see here pretty nicely, does this sort of little fluttering movement, which you'll see nicely right here. And that is not true cardiac activity because again, the LV walls aren't moving themselves. We call this valve flutter. And this is thought to occur as within CPR, we cause a lot of kind of circulation of the different contents in the blood of the LV. And as things settle out, they flow in between the left atrium and the left ventricle and through the aorta and kind of cause the valves to do this little flutter activity. But that's not true cardiac activity. Here's another case. Do you see any evidence of activity? Again, there's no true activity here, so pay attention to the walls of the LV. This patient is actually connected to the ventilator, and that's why they're getting these breaths every minute. But this activity that you're seeing is not arising from the walls of the LV.
This is important because there's been new data that's come out recently in reviewing patients with cardiac activity by ultrasound and arrest and how they do. This was a large cohort of 793 patients, and what they found was that cardiac activity on bedside ultrasound in the ED was associated with increased hospital discharge. And more importantly, this was a study that only looked at patients with cardiac standstill. In 136 patients with cardiac standstill, none of them survived. So my takeaway from that is that if I see no activity, that is equating to death and gives me more data to ensure or possibly even call a code. So how do we actually do this? The first thing you wanna do is prepare. So get the probe on the chest and inevitably you're gonna be stationed by the defibrillator. So make sure that the defibrillator is charged. During the pulse check, you're gonna click clip on the machine, which is automated to set up for six seconds and then step away and encourage your team to restart compressions. It is really important that you do not work to interpret the ultrasound during the pulse check, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. As CPR is ongoing, then you're going to interpret the ultrasound, looking for reversible causes or what interventions may need to be performed. And if you need to intervene, so if you identify a fine VF, go ahead and intervene prior to the next pulse check. And this is why we stress not trying to interpret the ultrasound during the pulse check. Because time and time again, there's been studies that have come out that says the use of ultrasound in the setting of cardiac arrest leads to delays in chest compressions. So again, click clip on the machine, step away, and encourage the team to restart compressions and do the interpretation of the ultrasound while the next round of CPR is ongoing. So first, you're going to prepare, again, pre-charge your defibrillator and get the probe in either the parasternal or the subxiphoid views. And here is what it should look like. So again, you're not trying to make any sort of interpretations prior to the pulse check. Once the pulse check happens, click save loop on the machine. And our machines at UW are programmed for six seconds. So this is a good timer. Click save loop and then step away and encourage the team to restart compressions. And then while CPR is ongoing, review the image. So this is a case of no cardiac activity. So follow your standard ACLS protocol. And if you need to intervene, go ahead and do so. If you find that the patient has fine VF, go ahead and shock it. Otherwise, manage medically with epinephrine, atropine, or lidocaine as needed. So that is how we use ultrasound in the setting of cardiac arrest. If there's one thing I want you to take away, it's please do not delay chest compressions. Again, click clip on the machine and step away, and do not try to interpret the ultrasound during the pulse check, as you may lead to a significant delay in chest compressions. So that's it. In this lecture, we talked about the E-point septal separation, or the EPSS, and how this is a useful quantitative tool to help you estimate what a patient's ejection fraction is doing, but again, not something that should entirely replace your visual estimation of the LV. That number I want you to remember, 10 millimeters. Anything greater than 10 millimeters, I consider to be a reduced function. We also talked about the right heart and why the right heart matters. Again, the ratio of left heart to right heart should be about two-thirds to one-third, and that, to me, is the single most important thing that you can use when assessing for right heart strain. And then last, we talked about cardiac arrest. Again, click clip on the machine during the pulse check and step away and encourage your team to restart compressions. Do not try to interpret the ultrasound during the pulse check, as you'll lead to a significant delay in chest compressions.